Two of the most basic measurements that you will carry out in the circuit simulator are checking the voltage and the current that appears in your circuit. There are multiple ways of going about when doing this, each with its own benefits. So hello and welcome back. Today I will be looking at how such measurements can be done in the circuit simulator as well as in real life and look at some of the cases when the two measurement methods don't really agree. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So let's start with the basics. If you have a transient simulation and a voltage source with some resistors, there are a few things that we can do here. So going over any of the nets, we'll highlight this red probe, which is our voltage measurement probe. Hovering over a net will tell us in the bottom left corner what the net name is, so net 008 in this case, and clicking will plot the voltage present in the net during the simulation. Now, any voltage is measured between two points, and by default, the reference to which the voltage was measured is the ground. If we wish to have a different reference, we can do this in two ways. One is to right-click a net and select the Mark Reference option. This will set this as the reference net to which any other measurement is done. Now, since it's not all that common to make multiple measurements with the same reference, another way is to select a net and then holding click, drag the cursor over another net. This also creates a similar measurement where the second net is the reference. Last thing to mention in the schematic editor is that you can right click on a net and enable the place.op data label option, which will highlight the voltage present in the net when the initial operating point was calculated. So in this case, it's 3.33. Now this can be a completely different value from what happens during the normal operation of the circuit, which might cause confusion. So for example, if we have a voltage pulse, the initial operating point voltage is zero volts, and this is the value that will be displayed. Even though if we check, by the end of the simulation, we are getting a completely different value. Now, the last thing to mention has to do with variable signals. So here I have a sine wave, and if we select to plot it out, let's just zoom in a bit on it, we can inspect it using the cursors. So by clicking over the net name, we get this cursor window, and we can go throughout the waveform to check its peaks or minimums or any other point throughout it. But another important feature appears when you hold the control key and left click on the net name. So here a new window appears with the RMS and the average value. And this applies only to the visible view. As can be seen, the interval over which this was calculated started at 370 milliseconds and ended at 390 milliseconds. Now, most of the measurements that we've just discussed can also be carried out with relative ease in real life. However, there are a few things to keep in mind to get the same results. So when you're interested in the DC level of a signal, the most common tool you will be using is a multimeter set to volts. This is a two terminal device, so you can easily plug it anywhere in the circuit. You can measure voltage that is referenced to ground or to any other circuit node. There is no major restriction in where you place the probes. On the other hand, when measuring variable signals, the most common tool is the oscilloscope. And with this device, there are a few things to be mentioned. First, the typical probe is unbalanced. It's not the same if you measure one way or the other, like you would with a multimeter. The probe ground is connected to the protected earth connection of the mains cable, so whenever that pin is inserted into the circuit, first of all, it brings a lot of capacitance, and secondly, depending on how the cabling is done, it could also cause a short circuit. So usually, the ground of the probe is connected to the ground of the circuit. If you need to measure the voltage between two nodes that are not ground, it's common to use either a dedicated differential probe or two simple probes. And then apply the subtraction from the oscilloscope's menu to get the desired result. So as long as you set up the measurement appropriately, is there really a difference between the measurements done in the simulator and the one done in real life? Well, the important thing to keep in mind is that the voltage probe in the simulator is an ideal infinite impedance device, whilst the one in real life is not so much. So to take an extreme use case, 
What I have here is a 5V supply connected to a voltage divider built with two 10 megaohm resistors. As long as you trust the values, you should already know that the voltage in the middle is around 2.5 volts. However, if we actually check this, the voltage drop on one of the resistors is somewhere around 1.8 volts. So we aren't really getting the correct division. But it gets even worse. We get the same voltage on the other resistor. In other words, the sum of the voltage drops on each resistor does not add up to the total supply voltage. And even more interestingly, if I use this other multimeter, I get completely new values. With this 830 type meter, I get around 0.4 volts on each resistor. Now, the main reason why we are not getting the expected values has to do with the fact that the real multimeter is not ideal. An ideal voltmeter presents an infinite impedance and resistance, whilst the real one will usually have a finite amount and in some cases this amount is non-negligible. So we can use another meter to check what the actual DC resistance is presented by each of our test meters. So we can observe that the first meter has around 12 megaohms, and if I put in the second one around 1 megaohm. Depending on the multimeter, this value will be higher or lower, and sometimes the datasheet will also contain this value. But the important point being that this is usually a non-infinite amount which needs to be taken into account when working with high impedance circuits. If we now perform a simulation on our test circuit and include the meter resistance, we can easily explain the observed values. So while the voltage divider measured with an ideal meter shows exactly half of the supply voltage, when we add in our two meters, we get about 1.76 and 0.4 volts respectively. So the real measurements were not wrong, you just need to take into account the meter resistance to get the correct value. A similar issue will present itself when measuring transient phenomena. When using an oscilloscope, it's important to remember that the probe, other than the DC resistance, usually 10 megaohms for the X10 probe, will also present capacitance. So if I use a signal generator with a 1 kHz square wave output and pass it through our 10 megaohm resistor divider and we try to measure it with an oscilloscope, we will first observe a deviation in the peak to peak amplitude caused by the probe's resistance. Again, we are nowhere near the 2.5 volts it's supposed to be, but we already knew this. However, we also see that the square wave isn't a square anymore. Because of the capacitance, the exact shape has been distorted. So in such cases, when measuring high impedance circuits, the result will also be impacted by the exact probe that is being used. So if I switch to this other probe, also a extend probe, but one that has a bit lower capacitance, the distortion is smaller. However, the amplitude is still wrong. Now, after looking from my component box, I also found this X100 probe. This has higher resistance and lower capacitance. And well, if we check this, well, it produces a slightly more accurate result. The observed behavior can again be easily reproduced in the simulator if we take into account the probe parasitics. So once these are placed in the measured line, we can compare the ideal use case with the practical measurements. So we can see the effect of our X10 probe, reducing both the amplitude and affecting the shape. And if we look at the X100 probe, we can see that the differences are much smaller than with the other probe. Neither of these represent the ideal measurement, but the smaller the parasitics, the closer we are to a correct measurement. In all fairness though, measuring megaohm resistant circuits is not all that common. So that will normally not be all that problematic. But probe capacitance on the other hand will cause headaches whenever high speed or otherwise capacitance sensitive circuits are being measured. Things like crystal oscillators, RF circuitry or switching nodes. Anyway, let's now turn to the other major electrical parameter that will be of interest in the simulator, the current. To start things off, I prepared a basic circuit 
in which I have a voltage source connected to a few resistors, everything in series. So it should be obvious that whatever the current is, its value is equal through each of our components. Now, after we simulate, we can check the current by simply going over the component where this current probe icon will appear. So when left clicking, the current gets plotted. Now, if we check another component, say this one next to it, we get the same value, 250 milliamps, but this time it's inverted. Now, while with voltages, there was always an absolute reference, the ground, with currents, this is no longer the case. If we go back to the schematic, the reference is highlighted in our probe with a small red arrow. Whichever way this is pointing will highlight what a positive current is. So with our two resistors, the arrow is pointing the same way, right to left. But the current is once flowing in an opposing direction in one of our resistors. So that's why we are getting a negative current. Now to change the reference, we can either edit the plotted current, so simply right clicking on it, we can add in a minus, or another thing that we could do is to measure the current through a trace. So this can be done by holding the Alt key and going over the trace. Here, the arrow, in certain cases at least, will be pointing the other way, compared to what the normal component is doing. Now, this method of measuring current through a trace has another important benefit, since it will easily allow the measurement of bits of circuit where multiple currents pass through the same electrical net. For example, in this right side circuit, we have a single electrical net that interconnects all of our resistors. But we can check what the actual current is through various groups by checking the current in different points of our electrical net. So we can look at the current through the upper two resistors, the lower two resistors, or the rightmost resistor. Of course, we could have done this by manually editing the plotted waveform, but doing it this way will be far more convenient especially with complex circuits. Anyway, regardless of the way in which we've plotted the current, we can again use the Ctrl plus left click on any of the plotted values to get the average and RMS values, in case this is of interest, of course. In a similar fashion to how the ideal voltmeter should be an infinite impedance device, the ideal ammeter should be a zero impedance device. However, in real life, the ampere meter, or whatever device you're using, does present a non-negligible amount of impedance. So, first of all, in most cases, to make a current measurement, you will need to insert the current measuring device in line with the circuit. So first, you need to interrupt the line and then add the measuring device in. So, to begin with, the exact tested trees will usually end up being extended. This brings extra resistance and extra inductance. Now, specifically for the ammeter, there are two common implementations. First is a shunt resistor based measurement over which you measure the voltage. So the current is calculated by dividing the measured voltage by the shunt's resistance. This technique is most commonly applied in things like multimeters, although it's also applicable with high frequency measurements. From a parasitic point of view, this method mainly adds extra series resistance, both in the connecting wires and the shunt resistor itself. Now the second common way of measuring current is by measuring the magnetic field that appears around the trace. When only the AC component of the current is of interest, this can be done with a current transformer. And when the DC component is also required, then a Hall effect sensor can be used. The more modern high performance probes use a combination of the two. Now, it's worth mentioning that while the Hall effect sensor does pick up AC variations as well, it's usually limited to around a few hundred kilohertz. So for wide bandwidth operation, you need to use both methods. In practice, the magnetic field transfer is usually enhanced by a magnetic core. So anyway, this technique will mainly be adding inductance to the tested trace. Now, to check all this, let's start off with a typical multimeter probe. This will add in somewhere around 60 milliohms based on the exact cable and how good the contact is. And then the actual shunt in the meter 
will also be adding an amount based on the exact current range that is being selected. So the 10 ampere range on this multimeter, if we subtract the cables, will be again in the 50 milliohm range. But if we change to lower current ranges, we will be adding in somewhere in the ohms region. The 200 milliampere range is 3 ohms and the 20 milliamp range is around 12 ohms. The exact value will of course depend on the particular device you are using. Now, for a current probe measurement, usually you will start off by cutting a trace and soldering in a wire loop, and then placing the probe over it. Fun fact, the typical probe has a small arrow, just like in the simulator, indicating which way the positive current blows. Now, when you're done measuring, just don't forget to resolder the trace. Anyway, to evaluate the setup, we can first measure the inductance of the added wire. In this case, it's somewhere in the 5200 nanohenry value based on the exact shape. The larger the loop area, the higher the inductance will be. But then, when you add in the current probe as well, the magnetic core can greatly increase this value. With this particular probe that I'm using, we reach almost 3 microhenry. So, depending on the exact measurement, this may or may not be acceptable. To highlight some of the possible impacts, I took the test circuit for the AD2165 and first added in a typical ammeter. So, 100 milliohms of series resistance on the input and on the output to measure the current. Now, the main way in which this impacts the behavior is by the voltage drop. The higher the series resistance and the current, the worse this is. Especially when measuring low voltage nets, in this case the supply is outputting 1 volt, so that's what we get at the output. The final voltage, which reaches our load, ends up being significantly impacted. In such a case, a magnetic field based measurement would be better since the added inductance would have a less critical effect compared to what DC resistance is doing. Now, in contrast, if we're trying to measure the inductor current, especially in more modern high frequency converters, the inductors which are used in the base converter have very small values of inductance. It's not uncommon to have less than 1 microhenry. So, if we're adding in an extra 1 microhenry of test probe inductance, this will completely alter the results. So, this is the waveform that we're getting with our current probe, and this is the waveform that we get with the base circuit. So, if the goal was to measure peak currents or any sort of inductor saturation, usually it's better to add a physical shunt and just measure the voltage drop over it rather than adding in a high inductance current probe. In the end, measuring the voltage and the current in a circuit is an important verification aspect both in the theoretical world of the circuit simulator as well as in real life. While the simulator offers multiple ways of ideal measurements, special care needs to be taken in real life since you will always have some amount of parasitics introduced into the circuit by the test equipment. In general, there is no single universal way of measuring electrical parameters, but rather each test case needs to be individually evaluated to observe which measurement technique will yield the best results. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.